Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. I've been looking forward to this one. Uh, it's Reason Studios Object. Now, I actually had to wait almost a week before I could start this, which initially was annoying, but I think worked out for the better. Because on the surface, this is not an easy instrument. It's actually very clever and I like it a lot, but I did need a few goes to start to be able to, you know, use it well. Uh, and that is going to be an issue for a few people, and we will talk about that as well some more. Reason Studios, this is a rack extension. If you want to run it as a VST, uh, then you can purchase Reason, which gives you access to the rack, which is what you're looking at now, and you can run the rack as a VST inside any door that is happy to run the Reason VST. I understand there's no particular limits or difficulties with that. Uh, but it is a, it is very much a Reason product. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, that I have been with Reason uh, exclusively for um, 15, 20 years, uh, and I'm quite well known in the community. So if I seem very dug into Reason, yeah, because this, this is my world. Object is a physical modeling synth. There's always been a lot of confusion about what physical modeling is. Basically, it's kind of like this AI... BS that people go on about, only it's more honest. So what it is, it's thinking about what are the mechanics, the physics of how sound works, and then creating models around that. So in other words, okay, we will do this because it's going to come out like that. It is initially a little confusing, but you will get there. Uh, it's not a everything synth for everybody. That's something to be very aware of. Let's have a little bit of a listen to some of the patches. This is how it opens. So we hear quite a lot of the hallmarks of physical modeling, which is that kind of noisy, kind of digital, kind of hyper real in an odd sort of a way. This is a bass patch. So a big bull fiddle. There's a certain amount of uh, playability. No, it doesn't have MPE, but with care and understanding of programmability, there is a fair amount of versatility to be had in here. Um, would MPE be great? Maybe. I've never had a little rubber keyboard to, to know whether it really makes that much of a difference if you care to be hands-on and tactile with existing controllers. Uh, the sound is interesting. It's capable of doing some sounds incredibly well and some sounds not so much. Again, this is very much what we expect out of physical modeling. Here, how the sounds aren't as even. Samples and synthesis tend to be very even. That's been the obsession with even, even, even. Physical modeling is not as even, and some people are upset by that. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't sit as well. It doesn't seem to sit particularly well in that modern EDM approach where people are going, it just feels like it doesn't sit well. It's like they don't know how to use it. Uh, but the variety is exactly what gives it that pseudo-reality kind of feel. Like there's a sax patch here. Do I think it sounds like a saxophone? No, not really. I would alter that patch for myself, I would put that on an album because I've done quite a lot of that sort of stuff already. It is a pretty impressive patch. So there's a selection of patches that they've pulled out, which honestly I don't think are necessarily the best patches that they have to offer. Something that really stands out 
is their drums. They've got a whole lot of drum sounds, and with the exception of hi-hats that in my experience tended to be a bit kinda accurate, but lacking in the bright sizzle, they are really quite impressive. So there is a lot to be said, but don't go off the obvious, dig more into what it can really do. So speaking of, let's just pull this guy out. Oh, one thing I did want to say, that um, with the effects, you notice there's no chorus. And digital synths tend to sound kind of dry and harsh. So popping on Hertz Delay, it's not like Reason doesn't have a great chorus itself, but Hertz Delay is really nice. It's really free, so hiahertz.com. It really does open the sound up. So a lot of what I play for you will have a Hertz Delay or a multiplier on it. Speaking of drums, there are quite a few kits that are put together and they sound like this. That is the kit, there's no reverb, there's no processing there other than what is within the kit itself. Interesting sound. That's not, I'm gonna say, particularly well played because that's just being semi-randomly generated. But the sounds are interesting and intriguing. Uh, for those who know Reason Kong, has a set of physically modeled drums, which on the surface kind of don't sound quite right. They definitely don't sound like the usual samples, but when you process them and you handle them right, you can get really, really great sounds that just sit so well in a mix. So without having dug too far in, there is a lot to be said about object just for drums. It's definitely very strong in mallety kinds of sounds. And one of the first things that I did with it, because I admit I did struggle right at the beginning with the feeling of being able to get anything I liked out of it, was, okay, how's that gonna go just as a sample source? So I recorded a sound. And pulled it into Gray. That was the original sound. I think it might have been off a preset that I modified a little bit as I was doing some learning. Moved around, put it into grain. A little bit of processing, and straight away, obviously, that would please the, the sort of drone crowd tremendously. So object has a lot beyond just being used directly as the synth on its own. This is using an external input. So the sound is being generated, the engine in here, which we will go over in more detail soon, rather than responding, responding to its internal exciter, is actually responding to this synth here. Proof, sound's gone, sound is back. So it is possible to use it either as just a dedicated effects unit, you know, push drum loops or whatever you want through it, vocals, whatever, um, and you get interesting results. Um, or to be able to use one synth sound as the driver for what this is going to do. And of course, you can mix and match. For a really complex layered sound. In terms of polyphony and CPU, I've probably got all my 16 notes sounding there. I've got two bars on a fairly, on, it's about a year old i7. Um, so it is a little thirsty if you let it get carried away. Uh, but for what it is, 
it's pretty efficient and you're rarely going to need a full 16 voices. Uh, you will probably find four or eight is fine and it'll stay on the one bar like anything else. So external input means that there's a whole other world to, to be explored. How useful that will be in reality, I don't know, but some people will find a sound in there and good on them. If I have the instrument and I'm undecided, then uh, it's only a matter of time before I do a thing or two which might make it to a record. I don't think it would be a central feature of my life. The thing we get into is how on earth does this work? Most people are relatively comfortable with subtractive synthesis. We start with an oscillator with a farty sand and then we hack bits off it. Normally mostly off the top with the filter, maybe some off the bottom with a filter, uh, and we get to a tone that we like. We maybe have some movement with some envelopes. That's subtractive synthesis because we're always cutting away from the initial thing. Additive synthesis is where we start with generally the most simple building block, which is a sine wave, and then we add another sine wave, and then another sine wave, and another sine wave. And simplistically, we add all those sine waves in the harmonic series. Uh, so just as when you press a note on piano, you get a full rich sound, another sine wave, that is the fundamental and all these overtones at the balance that renders piano. Additive synthesis is used an awful lot. Most people don't realize how much. Most modern wavetables are actually additive uh, resynthesizers. Uh, but it is complex on its own. This bears some similarity. Other people are going, oh, is it a kind of FM? No, uh, but again, there are some similarities. FM is a sort of an additive in the sense that we take our core oscillator, again, generally a sine wave, and we multiply it by another sine wave. Normally that multiplication is actually going to the um, phase, not to the actual pitch. You end up with a really different sound. And FM or PD, as is more accurate phase distortion, we add harmonics. Getting that concept of being able to say, I've got my fundamental sound, and then I can add detail to it, is fundamental to how this works. So we start with what's called an exciter. And then it goes through a model, which here is called an object or a modal, which we will get into in a moment. But we start with the exciter. You can hear that little pip sound. We can do that as various other kinds of things, but we'll leave that out for the moment. Mostly start with a, a little pip. Now this is akin to taking something like my coffee mug, yep, empty, or empty enough. I could put that through the audio in here. Coffee mug. So the point that we tap that, that's the beginning of sound. Now if I had something that was a lot more vibratory and I don't have a drum to show off, uh, when I hit this, you can hear more than just the tick tick, tick, because that's not a lot. You can hear some ringing. So what that does is when I hit this, that's what's called the exciter. That excites this, it makes this vibrate. And the way in which this vibrates, as compared to a piano, a drum, my uh, misbehaving 16-year-old daughter, that is the model. So the model for this would be that there's not a lot of ring or propagation of the sound. It's relatively dead, but it does have overtones because we've got that sense of brightness rather than it just being a tick, 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 tick. So that's the model. So remember, your exciter is what starts the model working without something to excite it, without something to make it start to vibrate. You will hear nothing. So this creates a vibration, and then this creates a resonance. Very simply put, each of these is just a different kind of resonator. You can look into the math and the pictures and the, if you want, and while it is good to know, it's not worth our putting up pictures and what have you because you're gonna go look into it or you're not. Uh, and if you don't, it's not very relevant. You'll just notice that the difference between objects and modal 
are different. They give you different sorts of sounds. Broadly speaking, we start to get a stringy sort of sound, like a plucked string. So... That's our guitar strings. Does it sound great? No, actually it doesn't. But that's where we've just got our fundamental and our oscillator for it. This, this model actually sounds better. Sounds more string-like. We'll pull out the exciter now. Guitar-like. If we want that to be warmer, we can make it brighter or warmer based upon the, the essential frequency at the beginning of the tap and the hardness of the object in which we tap with. So if I use my lovely fingernail to tap, we get quite a hard, bright sound. If I use my finger to tap, we don't get much excitation at all. So this changes the hardness. We'll take away the, the velocity stuff. gets softer. If we want... We can go really... Kind of like what they call a jazz guitar. So it's very soft. Because our frequency is low and our hardness is high, we start to get a kind of nylon guitar type thing. If we go very high frequency and very hard, it starts to become banjo-like. Um, so it's somewhere in between these is where we will find the thing that we're looking for. We can, of course, change how they behave with velocity. Harder, the harder we hit the key. And that matches reality. As you know, with the cup tapping, the harder I tap the cup, the more bright and excited the cup itself becomes until I smash it. Thankfully, this is not smashable. There's then the ability to diffuse. So if we make this nice and hard and bright, Hear how that sort of bows a little bit or rolls a little bit? We can change the shape of the initial tap being louder and then some and then sort of smoothing off or ramping in. Tighten the time, pull back our hardness. Now we're starting to get a more finger picked rather than a, a plectrum picked, a more finger because it's softer. And that's how we start to set up our tones. And again, we can swap that for this behaves exactly the same, or we can envelope it. So this now becomes what's called blown or bowed. And you've got different options for choosing the, the color of what we hear. Static is like record static. And in the right situation can be really useful, especially in the middle of patches. I don't know whether you can time sync that at all, but if we suddenly need to do a mandolin, probably not the best way of doing it, but you can do it. Noise pulse, so that's pulses of noises.
probably a little bit better for the mandolin thing. So the same pulse thing, only it's more erratic. And then a pulse, which we will look at later. That becomes useful for strings. Took me quite a bit to work out how to get that. And then just a low pass noise source. So again, you hear that that's just exciting. It's causing the object to do its vibrating thing. There is no object in here. There's just the concept, a model, as in a paper model of this. Now, the model doesn't look like the thing. Initially, you might go, but, 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 but where's the model that looks like a piano? Now, to, to some extent, they do have some things built in. I'm not going to go down that road. Um, by all means, go down that road. But I think the most excitement comes when you start opening this up and doing your own. Let's go back to an exciter. If we add a second, it comes in at the same pitching. But if we change our pitching, hear how that's starting to get brighter? So now that sounds like harmonics, where you actually pluck above the, the top nut on your guitar, you know, where it's, it's got the top of the, the, the fretboard and it's going off to the tuning pegs, your machine heads, and you pluck those, you get pink, pink, pink. We're getting that kind of sound. Sort of koto, looty sort of sound. We can add a click in here. This is how we build our sounds. Obviously, the more you understand how a sound is built, the more you can hear the elements of a sound if you're trying to build a very specific sound, the easier it gets. Most people haven't trained themselves to be able to hear the discrete elements of a sound. I know I wrote an article many years ago about um, sampling a um, glass harmonica, uh, which is a whole pile of glasses all put together and, and you play it with wet fingers and they can be beautiful or just a bit scary. Uh, and I broke it apart into the pieces and the bits and the pieces that I could hear and the mechanics of how it was happening. And that allows you to put more detail in, but you can't ever get it right, right. Let's add in a little bit of this. You'll find the things get very sensitive to the exciter, so you're often running them fairly low if you're not wanting them to sound overdone. So now we've taken this sort of looty koto y kind of thing and then given it some flute ish elements. With this, there's a, an object called coupling. What we have here is similar to simple additive synthesis in that each of these things that we've added is just added on its own, as in there is no particular relationship between these other than the relationship that we create when we hear them and turn them into one sound. But coupling means that every time this goes round and round, because this is a great big feedback loop. Each one of these is a feedback loop, a resonator, as in a very short delay with a very high feedback value. See now, we'll just pull this out for the moment. Tuning goes interesting, but now we get a very bell-like sound. And before you say to me, but Benedict, that sounds now useless because it's out of tune. Thankfully, Reason have thought carefully about that. They allow us to analyze that. So if you're playing a note and you hit this, it'll actually cut it off and it plays internally, I assume a middle C, and now it tells us, yeah, that's what the, the thing is. So you hit fix, you'll see the tuning here has now changed. So technically this is in tune. Obviously that's gonna have some interesting results in terms of its harmonics. 
But if you're looking for more clangorous bell sounds, then couple. If you're looking for less, then uncouple. There is also crossover, which allows you to sort of fade between the two. It's built on the coupling model, but this, I think they said, it was a, um, it's lifting the lower half out. So it's basically a high pass filter. You can hear our sense of tune is changing there. But if you are after pleasant sounds, you're generally gonna want them to be uncoupled. They explained key tracking, but I didn't get into it. So that's one model. Oh, the other thing that you can do here is that you can turn the key follow off. So here how we've got another thing here and it's not following the keyboard. That's what's called an enharmonic part of the sound. And most real world sounds have harmonic and enharmonic. So you've got a standard resonant frequency. When we listen to my coffee cup, we've got probably almost more inharmonic. It's not a beautiful sound. If we have a beautiful, high quality crystal champagne flute or whatever, it will ring nicely because everything is so pure, it's going to be harmonic. Overtones are nice. But where we get something like this, which was never meant to be a musical instrument, then there's no attention going into that. It will tend to sound inharmonic, as in out of tune with itself. So this allows you to provide, to add partials which are either slightly out of tune, which happen in real instruments. Like we might sort of say, okay, well. But adding that tone that doesn't move, generally you don't want it too loud, but some Asian type instruments, our feeling of what Asian instruments can have quite a strong inharmonic. But if you want still a pretty sweet sound, you can have out of tune or inharmonic sounds. And you hear how this adds an indefinable sense of it being a little bit more real. I don't think we're ever going to mistake those for real sounds, but at the same time, that attention to detail um, adds levels of reality, shall we say, that we don't normally get. So if we can have a couple of those, and make these really beautiful detailed sounds. And this is where object really shines because your more traditional forms of, uh, of synthesis, while some can allow this sort of detail, particularly additive, FM can too, if you've got enough programmability, but the more programmability you get, the harder it is to actually use it. You can do this sort of stuff. But this is surprisingly easy once you get your head around the thinking inside it. The other model is the modal model, generally referred to as modal synthesis. So that's the same exciter exactly. And here how we're getting a different sort of result. With this one, you can change the, the length of decay. Let's just pull these out of tune and turn that one off key. To... So they sound kind of like maybe old heavy bamboo or something like that chimes. And the, the modal is good for that. It somehow seems to sound more like a pipe or a tube type thing. So if you're looking for malleted wood, that's just changing the length at which something vibrates.
You can also change the gain. So it's a different way of putting it together. A malleted thing. If we add in we're getting a flute type thing. If we tune that, and I'll show you where I did, did that later, then you can get more of, into our clarinet, oboe, woodwind kind of thing. So making fantasy instruments you can widen so or you can pan or these ones you can widen if we put the two of these together You can't change what goes to each model. So you can't say, oh, I'll, I'll have the, um, the, the ADSR noise go to one and the impact to another. Uh, it, it's just how it is. But being reason, we would say, okay, I'll get the elements that I want perhaps in one instrument. I'll create a combinator, separate the instrument out into the two halves. So one instrument's got the exciter going to the model, the other's got the exciter going to the object, and then you mix them using a mixer. But it allows you to create these quite detailed instruments with surprisingly little work. It is also possible, let's pull this model out for the moment, to take object one and listen directly to the exciter or to listen to some or all of the modal. As you hear, it starts to get kind of loud, because remember, this is all a really high feedback. So they're all kind of on the edge of just screaming. So again, we've got a Interesting seems like it could be a real thing, but just isn't. Uh, and those are best built in the piece, so they suit. Now the object has various things that we can do. We can collide. For you guitarists, you are used to that if you hit the strings too hard, and you see this with bass players, if you hit the strings too hard, the string itself will bang into particularly the frets. So that's a collision. Yeah, as in it hits the body of the instrument and that changes the sound. It kind of half mutes the sound. You can then set it so that it bounces. So you can hear it continuing to bounce off the And every time it bounces, it changes the resonance. Similar to Eddie Van Halen tapping up here, it goes limp, and then goes tap, 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 because that tapping changes. It actually restarts the um, the pluck of the string. And if you've got enough, <laughs> you've got enough gain, you can get enough sound out of an electric guitar, in particular, just with tapping. So while this isn't tapping as such. It's just having that string bang into itself and get reset. Can sound great, can sound awful. You've then got this pitch mod. A lot of sounds that are struck or plucked will tend to come in sharp. Think about it, electric guitar, we hoe into that string. We actually stretch it 
boing, 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 boing. Again, if you watch um, some videos where they're really close up on, on the guitar and the strings, or particularly the bass, I think there's some Cure videos where you really see the string going boing, boing, boing. I think it's Tolhurst who tends to dig into his instrument. That movement is because we've dug into it with a pick. Here's one I prepared earlier. It's not a pick at all. It's actually something my partner she just got a 3D printer and she printed out. That moves that string. Oh, I broke my thing. Um, and so it starts a little sharp. <laughs> it's a little interesting because of the, the extra noise. So we can get that sound and feel of it going a little sharp. That's just with pitch, or we can have it changing the the sand, the, the, the timbre and how it works. Again, you can get some great sounds or weird sounds. Here, how a little bit of it really gives us this nice feel as though it's something real. We'll pull those out again. And then dispersion. Dispersion is a little like a ring modulator in that it takes all the frequencies that we've set up, all those overtones and all, all the frequencies that are coming out, and stops them from being as ordered as, we, as we've set them up to be. We've set them up to be nice and ordered, so they sound pretty. This kind of makes them do this. It sort of spreads them in a bad way, like the Red Sea, I guess. Great for bell sounds. Might need to retune. Because now we've got enharmonic. Things are a little out of tune. Let's pop that back where it belongs. And then we've got the ability to modulate the dispersion. So rather than setting a dispersion to be just that way, so it's always that way, we can now have it move around, which gets interesting. And this can howl. So they very much warn you this can get noisy because you've got these things all working together and those delay lines which are just looking to get out of control. The dispersion filter, I don't feel like it's very clearly explained and like a lot of things here, it sort of seems to work backwards. There's logic why it works the way that it does. But I think the filter is designed to mute things over time as in, because you see when it's open, they seem to kind of ring forever which if we hit a problematic frequency. So if you want a sound to seem unnaturally bright over time, and we can analyze that. Super cool for these sorts of witty Asian type sounds. If we put our modal back in. playing with the wrong hand, that we get really, really interesting results. Of course, if we put the coupling back on, get some very interesting noises. If it does take off, then just turn your decay down. Damping. Notice how with the modal model, we can set how long we want each one of these overtones or tones to resonate for. You can say, oh, I want that to resonate for 100% of this time. I want that to resonate for 25% of this time. We don't have that here. We've just got straight level. I want it this loud or, or not. But we do have the decay here. Let's just go back up to and put ourselves in tune. An overall decay. And we can set it so that when we release a string, it automatically mutes. So if you're wanting to do guitar mutes for your death metal piece, 
This is in theory how it will get done. Will it really work out in your favor? I'm not convinced. Um, but where there's a will, there's a way. I've made several records relying on the concepts of heavy metal using nothing but synthesis uh, and often used the Carpless Strong, uh, which is a form of physical modeling, uh, that oscillator inside um, Europa, which sets off a string type sound. But the damping means that we can choose to damp high frequency variously. That's sort of like the filter slope. Yeah, it does take some time getting used to, but we can finesse. how we want the, 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 the low mids and highs of that instrument to behave. Generally lows always stay in, but if we want that instrument to kind of lift off, hear how that changes it? And again, these kind of operate a little differently from what you're used to. As you go higher on the keyboard, you can lose some parts of the sound because they're gonna go so high and create a lot of problems. If that is problematic, then you can either look at key tracking or drop your pitch and then... But in terms of general playability, you will get what you want. You can also change your position in the object. So that's a little like where you pluck on a guitar. If you pluck right down on the, the bridge, like the, the, the body of the guitar bit where the strings attach into the guitar, you pluck right down there, like you watch Lemmy from Motorhead playing, you end up with a really quite a hard, a salty kind of a sound. If you play up right in the middle of the string, then you get this really warm, uh, rich sound. So that's more of a George Benson might be playing up here, whereas Lemmy's playing right down there. So this, you can choose where you're playing from right up here. There is, in theory, nothing to stop you from playing your guitar right up here, right up at the top. So on your open E string, you could be playing right up against the nut at the top of the fretboard. Probably isn't gonna work very practically, but in theory you can. And we can set that to randomize. So each hit will move about a little bit. In some situations, it will be more obvious than others. Again, there are templates. Not super interested in those. Over time, I might look at them simply to say, oh, okay, that's how they work out. You know, say I, um, I assume that's a drum with a skin on it. Um, but. I'm not that kind of guy. <laughs> I'd rather work it out myself. You can also remove low frequency from things. So like with... I'm going to light... Object 2 is exactly the same as Object 1, except it can pull the sound in directly from the exciter or from Object 1. So we can pull that in, turn it on. It will tend to be a bit. And then let's just go straight to an inharmonic sound. So just that little bit of it in the mix. gives us a really interesting sound. So it's relative to additive, but the way that it works 
is different. If you're not familiar with it, get a, um, a delay, turn the time as low as you can go. We're talking like a couple of milliseconds, anything sort of 50 to 60 milliseconds and below, and turn the resonance right up just before it starts to howl. Make sure you limit it across your system and then feed it little tap sounds and hear how it turns them into tones. That's mostly it. We do have some effects, an EQ, which we can use to pick out Nice, works very nicely. There's the same drive. Don't sniff at them, they can really... add good detail or body, because they'll bring out little unexpected parts of the sound. Compressor, I'm not super sold on. I've never really been sold on that and delay and reverb as we've seen. The delay doesn't have modulation, but it is a, um, a target in here. So delay time, it will modulate just fine. But as you noticed, no chorus. But we can pull in any kind of chorus that we want. Higher hertz, delay. Might be a little bit excessive. And it really works very, very nicely with that. Oh, there's one more thing that um, people will dig. And initially I thought, wow, this is actually a little bit cool because normally I'm not a fan. And it, it is well thought through because I'm not a fan of randomize, but you've got a randomize option. So if we've got this and we're thinking, yeah, I kind of like this, but maybe there's an alternative, but I'm not sure how to make it. You can hit the randomize button, which will come up with, well, anything from, so this is the, the new, model that it's given us and we can back that to somewhere that we like it or we can get rid of it if we think that it's really a good plan and that's a keeper then we hit okay otherwise we just randomize until we go yep that sounds like a winner not so sure about that but So it's randomizing this and we can choose which of the three models it goofs about with. People are excited by it, but the trouble is, is it is random. Some models and some types of sounds, it will work a little bit better than others. You're generally gonna to wanna to keep the numbers low. Again, uh, this is, is kind of a whole exercise in its own right. We've got the modulation matrix where you can really take sounds and bring them alive. There are also some pretty unusual choices. Black key, as in you can use hitting a black key to make it do something. Uh, you can choose a single key in the octave. So we could say every time I hit a C, I want it to collide. So C could suddenly make the collision rise. Uh, or um, C could be pushing tune more than every other. If we're modeling a guitar, um, or particularly a bass, because those strings are big and heavy, then you might say that E is going to push sharper than every other string, simply because it's bigger. Uh, is that perfect for how playing happens? Not necessarily, but you can set various controllers to do all kinds of things. You've got a couple of CV ins, only two in this case. Um, you can latch your CVs, meaning that they will pick the value when the note is played and hold it, so it's a kind of a sample and hold. Um, uh, envelope followers, there's, there's all kinds of things in here which are a little unusual and that allows you to do some pretty interesting stuff with it. I'm not going to dig into that because you're going to understand that, fundamentally at least, or you're not, in which case it's not particularly relevant for you. So I'll go through my good and bad and then look at some examples that I made. 
What's good is that it does give you access to a whole pile of unique sounds. I think far more if you're going to program this than if you're just going to be a patch diver and then maybe hit random. But I'm prejudiced that way. You can really build really interesting sounds with exactly the detail that you want within the confines of the instrument and the laws of physics. It is very strong in mallet type sounds more so even than plucked sounds. While we can get very nice sounds here, you hear how that feels more like a malleted string, koto or whatever, the ones you hit, than a guitar type thing. That's not to say you can't do quite nice guitars, and often it's a case of working out how to get there. But in terms of mallets, it's very, very strong, especially if you're using a combo of modal and object or a couple of objects to build these sort of really detailed type sounds. Its programmability and workflow is really good once you understand it, once you grok it, once you get the sense of, ah, oh, that's how that thinks and that's how that works. It's very reason and reason are very, very good at giving things that on the surface look a little bit like, well, it's not gonna do anything, but somehow becoming far more practical in use. This is why I use Europa and Thor and even Subtractor for just about everything. If I can hear it, I can make it, in, um, particularly in Europa, uh, because it's got access to lots of different ways of doing things. Uh, the same with Algorithm. I love Algorithm. If I can hear it, then chances are I can build it there. This would be the same. So okay, so going, okay, what's happening there? How do I do that? Yep, okay, that's the kind of approach that I want. It takes time and experience, but its programmability and workflow is where this wins. I've used, tried quite a few um, physical modeling things. Normally I don't last very long with them because they are just too techy, too obtuse, uh, maybe technically more capable of this, but if they're just a pain in the ass to use, I'm just gonna go, yeah, too hard, I'm not gonna do that. I'll go do something that I feel comfortable doing so that I can get somewhere rather than bogging down in somebody else's spreadsheet kind of mentality. What's bad? Okay, it is not strong on bowed strings. You'll see I do manage to get there just, but Reason do have their own bowed string physical modeler, which came out first called Friction, again with a K, uh, which is surprisingly interesting for bowed strings. And so I think they've said, okay, we'll let this specialize in malady type stuff because bowed and even to some extent plucked strings has been covered by Friction. Um, it does make this a little less of a does everything uh, so it reduces my interest a little bit. But at the same time, I can understand the wisdom of that because the more you try to make one instrument do, the more you can get in trouble, especially with this sort of stuff. This does do passable plucked strings and you can get some bowed stuff out of it, but it's a weakness. It will always be that case. It is initially difficult. If you don't have a grounding in this kind of stuff, and I do, I still found it a bit like, and, and my very first opinions were like, this doesn't do anything, this is stupid. But I held in with it and I kept coming back day after day and suddenly it's like, oh, now I'm getting results with this and then it becomes great. The RTFM is very modern. It says really obvious things like the pitch mod sets the pitch mod amount. Thank you very effing much, Captain Obvious. That was stupidly useless. However... They probably realize that most people are never going to RTFM and there is a pretty good, Ryan Harlan has made a pretty good primer um, on a video. So go watch the primer. Um, it's not the same to me because I'm a reader and I like reading those manuals like the old Craig Anderton manuals where he would really go off on a tangent, which was great, to help you understand the thinking, the way that it works, the way that it extrapolates here. Like, I don't really know what that does. They think they've explained it, but it's just Captain Obvious. Oh, yes, the filter filters the filtering. Okay, I really learned a lot there. Uh, so the manual is not useless, but it's not very useful. Go watch the video instead. But overall, it's a very impressive instrument if it serves what you're looking for. 
let's pull this guy out of the way. Bye bye. And over here. Here are some I prepared earlier. This was my first attempt at bowed strings. We do have a Hertz delay in here for chorusing type duties. As you hear, it's nobody's cello. It sounds like some kind of screaming banshee. But I did work it out, as you'll see. But it's quite a nice example of the kind of otherworldly kinds of sounds that you can make with this that I wouldn't say were impossible with somewhere between Grain and Europa, but nowhere near as easily tobble as with something like this. And you can see because we have enharmonic objects, like object two is adding a certain amount of that screechiness. So a sort of like blowing a great big pipe a tube. <laughs> Stringy type thing. So really, really interesting instrument that takes very well to external sounds. Combination of, is it a this, is it a that? And, and you do end up somewhere really interesting. This was a couple of days later, uh, and in theory, I'd kind of given up on bowed strings. The way that I have gotten there is not flying in something else, but using this pulse exciter. And a little bit of the other exciter. But the trick is in the modulation matrix, I've taken that the key, so the key follow, is going to noise rate. So that's the tuning of that pulse oscillator and you set it to 80, that being the equivalent of 100. Uh, and <laughs> it's just a recent thing, <laughs> you like 80 to be 100. Uh, and it now tracks. The pop's coming from the little exciter here. Now I could set up all kinds of things where performance will change the attack of the ADSR, but I didn't dig too much into that. I did make a variation of this and actually release that into some reason groups um, with some people who were like, ooh, isn't that cool? Uh, so it was one of one sound of this doing more of a lead and then some um, something from Europa, which was a combination of car plus strong and just good old fashioned oscillator for the second sound. Basic, simple har harmony and what have you. And it, it sounded really nice. And then just using the same technique as we've shown, we'll get that exciter out of there. Modal doesn't work well for this, it just sounds tuby. But just adding a little bit of overtone. Up higher. We lose the sweetness of a string. Uh, much as I tried, I couldn't get that to come out. It starts to sound pipey. But nonetheless, if played appropriately, you do end up with a really pretty workable sound, but it's hard and it's not the strength of the instrument. But in terms of saying, okay, I'm gonna create my own sound, not to compete with the BBC SO, because that's, I think, an absolute wrong way of going about being a synthesist, but to say I'm going to create this unique semi-real, semi-otherworldly instrument for whatever I'm going to play with it, then I think this is just aces in that sense. And then a guitar.
People are going to go, oh, that's kind of a guitar. But there are other things going on in here as well. The exciter. You can hear it's a bit broad. That's the diffusion. Through modal, it again just has that wood block kind of sound. Didn't really do anything with that. With aftertouch, it's very subtle. You can hear it just move a little bit. So we've got a little bit of movement there. Vibrato is set. And I have the rate of the vibrato change for every key press. As much as they want, they are going to uh, fret and vibrate at a different rate. And one of the giveaways for synthesis in this sense, the same with contact libraries and what have you, is that often the vibrato is exactly the same. And the same with there's another LFO uh, set to the, the uh, to delay time. So that's giving us a little bit of modulation on the delay. I think I did with this or something else I played with moving the decay time around a little bit as well. Are we going to fire our guitarist and use this? Absolutely not, at least I hope not. But in terms of could we create a really interesting, unique instrument that's not a preset uh, and that's going to, if we use it wisely, sit very, very nicely in our mix as being like, oh, great. Somebody did say, look, this is just sort of a shoe in. This is great for epic, how oh, I hate that word, uh, for film score stuff. Yeah, definitely. The, there is a, a strong sense in here of that kind of evocative sound that draws you in, in part because of its weirdness. Uh, you've got to manage that well. Where I've heard most people make quick songs, which have been thrown together using presets and what have you, they have just sounded weird. I felt like they've failed far more than they've won. But I think that's largely just because they've tried to use these sounds as though they were loops just dropped in from somewhere else. Oh, this is this is all rather than going, how do I finesse this sound to make it work? So it's a really, really interesting instrument that you do need to take your time with. Uh, and if you are looking for a richer sound, while the onboard effects are good, I'm not sold on the reverb, but it does work nicely. I think these are impulse responses, which I'm never sold on, but there's nothing to stop you from bringing in another reverb. Let's just look here at, I've got a whole pile of them, but let's again, actually just choose multiplier. Pull out the delay too. So that's dry. Apart from my poor playing, sounds nice, it becomes really warm. I think it probably could use some EQ to pull some tubbiness in it out, but that's all going to depend on mix. So it's super, super instrument for what it's good at. What it's good at, it absolutely excels at. What it's not good at, it can be passable or give you a really different result, something very unusual, or just fail. But that's fine, because everything should have what it's good at. But it's not a one-trick pony, unless you only use presets, uh, in which case, 
Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I think that you would be better off bringing in an actual sound designer at that point, sort of saying, hey, look, we we want to do the Peter Gabriel thing and, you know, be really uh, – and guess what Peter Gabriel does? He makes some of his own sounds, but, yeah. hello, Larry Fast, you're still alive? Wonderful. Come on over. Real world. Yes, still there. And – I don't know the process with Larry in those situations with Peter Gabriel or whoever he has making sounds for him. He's not the only one who uses a synthesis. Uh, he's the, I mean, I do it sometimes for people. Um, I like it when they actually send me the piece. They send me what they've currently got in an MP3. They send me the MIDI for um, that line at least and an MP3 with that instrument missing and explain kind of what they're looking to achieve. Hopefully not saying you've got to nail so-and-so's sand, because unless it's a cover, that's just a stupid, stupid plan and guaranteed to face plant because half the time it's processing and playing that makes the sand that they're after. But then I build the sand in the mix. Um, obviously, that depends on location as to whether they sit with me or not. Sometimes having people sit with me is great. And if they're like a really good collaborator like Jake Cropley, who I work with, uh, sometimes it's a pain because they, they don't understand how it works, which is fine because that's why they're hiring me, but they don't necessarily want to understand how it works. So rather than listen and learn, they just keep, but you're supposed to do this. <laughs> you're supposed to be quiet to let me do my job. So if, you, if you're at that point where you want to bring in interesting sounds, but you're not the kind of person to really be able to finesse these and make them so that they fit well in the mix, hire a specialist, you will be really pleased. Final words on it. I keep being asked the question because I'm seen as somewhat of a specialist in the Reason community. Fair enough. I've been at it for a very long time and I do a lot of work. Uh, people are saying, should I get it? I think if you're asking the question, maybe the answer should be no. If you don't see the, oh, I can do that, then probably it doesn't make it a bad instrument. It probably just makes an unwise investment. It seems to me that you're going to spend the the $100 on it. Oh, and at this point, it reminds me that I didn't bring up the thing. So yes, in terms of cost, um, uh, it's going to be $99 um, at full price. If you're going to get value out of this, hell yeah. Uh, if you're going to be a little unsure sooner or later it'll probably end up being able to be bought for like sort of 49.59 then definitely it's going to be worth that but if you're not going to really use it and you're not going to get value from it you're not going to dig in you know maybe just press the randomize button three times and then abandon it it's not worth a dollar not because the instrument's poor just because it's not relevant for you. Just as why I don't buy a lot of the things that people say, it's so pro, you have to get it, man. It's just like, it's not worth a dollar because I'm going to use it a little bit and then never use it again. It'll probably never even make it to one track. Waste of time and money for me. So know yourself there. If you are like me and going to really get in and go, ooh, I can, I can make that do this. And that takes time to really understand this. Then yes, there's a... There's a lifetime in here, but it's nowhere near as broad as Thor or Europa or Algorithm. Absolutely nowhere because it focuses around the malady thing. Unless, of course, you're one of those weird performance arty type people who every single sound in your mix is some kind of weird malady thing, or you're the blue man group, in which case <laughs> this is your whole future. Get it now. Stop listening to me. So who does it apply to? It applies to real sound designers. Uh, yes, there are presets, and those drums are very interesting. I have not dug into them enough, but they are very interesting. Uh, maybe just saying, oh, well, I'll spend the money and I'll get these unique drum kits. Maybe that works for you. But it's an odd duck, simply because the sounds that come out of PM are odd ducks, because they're neither the right sound or sort of synth right sounds. They're always kooky, odd sounds, which is a weakness or a strength, depending upon how you're going to use it. All right, it's an instrument that I think is super. Am I going to buy it? I am unsure. I'm undecided at the moment. If it were in my arsenal, I would use it. 
how much I would use it is where I become question mark. In fair part, just because, as I say, I can get almost anything I want out of Europa or algorithm alone. But there are some things in here that are in excess of what they will easily do. That's not to say they can't do them, but in excess of what they will easily deliver in terms of final sounds. Um, so for the moment, I'm going to err on the maybe not. Not because I don't think it's good. I think it's really impressive and very, very amazing work. And I'm, I'm super delighted to see it. Uh, but if and when I've got some kind of voucher or something like that that comes up and I get it for $50, yeah, shoe in. It's, it's worth that. So it will not be the first in my list. It'll probably still be like Europa, Thor, Subtractor and then object, just like I've got their um, their first additive synth. Um, I do bring it out and use it sometimes, pulsar, um, but it's just not it's not my center. It's not my home. You're going to have to work this out. Being reason, they of course allow you to try it and use it 100% with no limits for 30 days. After that, it just goes and that's it. So use your time wisely. Choose your time where you can really play with it and really spend some time with it and keep coming back after over a few days because the first day, it'll probably break your brain. And then the second day, especially if you watch the video, it will get a little easier and then suddenly you'll be like, oh, now I've got it, now I'm off. All right, Benedict for Higher Hertz. Uh, that's higherhertz.com. I know why I gave up on doing that. Uh, and there's a different stream of information there. Um, if you have any questions, not about reason specifically, even though I know an awful lot about it, we're not reason support. But if you have questions about this, ask them down below after hitting subscribe, please. And if you do have me on your um, Facebook or whatever, I'd rather you ask the questions publicly rather than firing me private messages. While I'm delighted to help people, private attention is commercial attention. Uh, public questions, I'm happy to do. I put aside a few hours every day for, um, for pro bono, which is public stuff. Uh, but if you're coming to me wanting my unique assistance and, well, not actually rewarding me for it, uh, then it's just a little uncool. Uh, especially if there's never any reward like talking publicly about, hey, I went to Benedict and he gave me this wonderful solution or he helped me with this, that and the other to encourage people to say we should hire Benedict. Uh, so please ask your public questions publicly. If you're wanting to hire me, brilliant. Then talk to me privately because that's private work. Okay, that's it. If you're at all interested, get this, try this. Or oh, please don't also ask me how it compares to every other um, PM out there. That's up to you as to what you dig. I dig this more than any other PM I have ever used. So there's the answer to that question. Now, of course, if you go asking that question, I'll know that you didn't watch the video. So <laughs> you probably won't get a good answer, if any. All right, have a great day. Spend time, have some fun with it.